uh, I am just asking them to consider um, the current context, what is unique about the time now, and what is universal that um, entrepreneurs can really seek out and demand from uh, the universities. And I want to just um, bring in some of the uh, specific examples from Dr. Tanko about what are the internships, how do we have these collaborations, how do we have this kind of feedback loop between the private sector, between the nonprofits, between the working mm. space and the education oh. space, and how do we think of the unique role that the universities and tertiary education plays um, and what we should be seeking from that space. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll invite anybody who, um, who would like to respond. All right, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, there's still an opportunity for specialization mm. uh, in all various areas of life. I mean, uh, a lot of people will think that yes, the future is AI, uh, the future is uh, machine learning. Um, we can't all be uh, AI specialists. And indeed, as a computer scientist, I need a specialist to be able to capture you know, the, the, the knowledge that, the, that the, the algorithms of the AI is actually is, is requiring. And that needs to be updated all the time. So I think it's important that, that we still have some specific areas and specific uh, knowledge and skills that is required across. However, uh, that, that is required independent, I mean, specifically for different subjects. However, I think that there, are, there, are, there is a gap, actually. There are soft skills that are often uh, not actually emphasized, uh, particularly in university education. And some of those soft skills include, and these are, these are some of the skills I believe that employers, that employers usually look forward to. Uh, I think whatever degree or whatever specialist, uh, specialism that you become, you need to be able to learn to work as a team. You need to learn to, uh, to be able to communicate, uh, whether you become an entrepreneur or work for yourself or work, I mean, uh, work for someone else. You need to you need to be able to have uh, to, uh, to learn how to work, how to communicate. You need uh, problem solving skills, mm. and you need to be adaptable. You need to learn to be adaptable to the changing world, because I think the most important thing, actually, as far as knowledge is concerned, is that you are able to adapt to a particular situation, to a particular changing. Uh, changing uh, paradigm and, and, and so on and so forth. So those are some of the important aspects that I think we need to, to look at. We also need whatever area you need, uh, you are learning, we also need to look at industry-specific knowledge. So for your industry, what are the specific knowledge and specific skills that are required you know, for you to actually enter into that particular industry? A medical doctor, for instance, of the 21st century, uh, should be looking for uh, industry, uh, certain industry uh, specific skills. Mm -hmm. And of course, a computer scientist, if you're studying computer science as, a, as an example, and, and you are not keen in into the contemporary development, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, and so on and so forth, then you know that you're actually been uh, missing some of, some of the points. So those, those are some, some of the few things that uh, I think that we need to, to look at. I think by and large, I agree that I think industry, industry has been uh, uh, more or less uh, driving the change because the, mm -hmm. there, there, is the, there is the drive for you know, immediate, quick response to solutions or problems. And, and therefore, there must be a synergy between industry and academia. And I think that is one of the things that we need to really look at. In, uh, unfortunately, in other parts of Africa, like Nigeria, one of the problems that we are actually facing is that synergy. And that is what, one thing that we must you know, harness to ensure that there's synergy between, between academia and industry in order to make sure that, that the skills and indeed the knowledge and skills that are, that are learned in universities and also in colleges actually are skills that are required in order to make, uh, uh, to, to, to make uh, the, the contribution to the development and, uh, and, and, and globalization. And of course, uh, uh, one of the things that we that we know, for instance, now is that a computer scientist in Nigeria is a computer scientist. He's a global computer scientist. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the question of whether, whether there's, uh, there should be a difference between, between the country, uh, country and, and other countries, I don't think that should, should, should be the issue now. If you are 
uh, if you are a practitioner, you should be able to practice you know, everywhere. And, and, and I think that trend is beginning to grow even, even from Nigeria. Uh, I have seen a lot of fintechs actually coming, coming up and, and, and developing for, for, for uh, United States of America uh, companies, and they are still in Nigeria mm. and, um, uh, uh, and, and, and other parts of the world. So it is, it is I, I think there's the globalization of, of education is, is really one thing that we must, we must be able to, uh, uh, to ensure that we, we also harness. Uh, and, and I think that's just one of the things that I want to, want to make a contribution. I think before I spoke, because this is probably the last time I'll have the, uh, the, the opportunity to, to talk, but um, I, rem I remember when I was in the UK, I was, I was a lecturer in the University of Hull for over 13 years. And one story that I always want to share, and that is where I, I emphasize the issue of, of uh, uh, job creation skills. I had about 30 something students in a, in a class. And, so, and one of the students, day one that I had a personal supervision with that student, told me that they want to become a millionaire by the time they, they leave the university. First track, by the time the student was leaving the university, was finishing the university, I asked the student, now it is time for you to declare the, one, the millionaire pound that you, that you have achieved with the University of Hull. And he said to me, I have not yet achieved a million, but I can assure you that 50% that of the students that were graduating together in your class, I have employed them. 50% of the students in my class are working for me. And five of them are directors of my company. And I think that's the kind of vision that we're expecting. And that is where the issue of creativity, the issue of critical thinking, yeah. the issue of innovation, yep. whatever, whatever that you are, you are studying at the university degree, you need to be able to bring that into four. Thank you. If you can ask, we'll ask a stack of them, and then uh, feel free to respond or ask questions of each other. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to combine a, a couple of these questions. Someone asked, uh, how can educational institutions become more flexible in responding to industry skill needs? And I'll pair that on with Professor Salami and, and Tope. There's a question there. What do you see, Tope, as ways your company could collaborate with these VCs to help increase the practical part of higher education? And Professor Salami, what, what ways do you see as uh, collaborating with companies like Topes to kind of a hybrid industry skills with higher education? Okay. And so, so, do I go ahead? Yeah, uh, I think uh, in terms of flexibility, and I think a lot of that has to do with the curriculum which of course, like I said earlier on, is regulated. But then we have window space where you can have local content and also to drive that with collaborations, to drive that with what kind of skills that you want to impact on these uh, students uh, or graduates so that they can at least not only be employable or even self, you know, uh, 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 entrepreneurs, but also to be able to be global ready for the markets, the space, the market space. So I think we do a lot of that. Now, a lot of the collaborations that we're having with industries are almost driven on what can they do to enhance the university or the curriculum. But I think the other part also, when I was a student here in the States, I know that at the graduating class, industries will come around. This is what we want. These are the persons we want. We also think that industry should be able to dictate to some level what they really want, what kind of skills would they want, so that we are able to develop curriculum together and share those curriculum so that we graduate students that can be irrelevant in those areas. I say, for instance, my university is trying to be, uh, you know, very strong in engineering. So what have we done? We've gone out there to look at companies that are oil and gas, and we said to them, now let us sit on a round table. 
which areas do you think you need uh, expertise in terms of our students to graduate our students? And they have done that by sponsoring students. They've done that by uh, uh, sponsoring research work that are tailored specifically to their needs. And then also, in our own case, we've gone to say, look, these are areas we also think that you can assist us. And so why, rather than just now dictating to us, can you send your personnel, send your, your uh, industry workers to the university so that they come to teach our students? We have, of course, the legal aspects and all of that, so that from two angles, we are doing the same thing, but at the end of it, we would have empowered our students. That is, of course, you are dictating what exactly you need out there, and we are also saying, look, can you help us for our staff development, student development, to bring in some of these areas and come and collaborate with us. So we, in, in those ways we are, and then of course the other question is, how do we collaborate with his companies? Definitely, I'm just getting to know about him. I'm sure maybe others know him, but in areas where we think we can collaborate in terms of our students going for internship, he bringing his, some of his staff to training our students on ground, definitely we'll do that. So beyond here, we're going to exchange you know, uh, uh, contacts and then so that we can find ways of synergizing and also uh, driving our students to become relevant in his uh, company and of course for our own development to both staff and students. Thank you for this. May I ask just a, a brief follow on for that, Iman Chopo, if I just, just because we did speak yesterday about this work that um, may be happening with some of the bigger oil companies. And uh, and I just wanted to be, when large companies come in, they can also often train for entry level workers. Mm -hmm. And we were speaking about the need to ensure that the um, that other skills, that are the leadership skills, so that the students are actually taking over these companies and that it's coming, um, so that it's not just US companies coming into mm -hmm. uh, uh, serve an external role. And uh, so I just wanted to ask you to speak a bit about the breadth of um, education that's needed so that you have leadership. Um, because if a, if a company dictates, they may say, oh, well, here's the jobs that we need to fill. Yeah, well, again, universities are autonomous. So there is no way uh, industries are going to come and have corporate uh, leadership within the system so that we don't have conflicts in that area. But for us, like I said, I mentioned to you yesterday, that we have programs in leadership. So not only do we want these uh, students to have the skills to be able to work in these industries, but also to aspire to become leaders themselves. So we teach them lots of management, we teach them lots of uh, leadership skills, so that outside just the hands-on, they are also ready to lead. And so we emphasize all of that. So it's a, a one-stop you know, one shop, you know, as it were, where we bring in all these components. And that is why we see we have regulatory body that looks at our curriculum from time to time. Indeed, I think every four years, they come in to look at what we're doing, what we're doing right, and what we're not doing right, they correct, they amend, and then we amend so that we can suit the demands of today and even for the future. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you. Uh, there is something that uh, is actually predominant and then we, I think that a lot of us are, are not really looking in that direction. There's a disruption. There's a disruption. Um, education is heavily regulated. But I can tell you that industries that are even more, industry and sectors that are even more regulated have been disrupted. You go into the medical sector. Uh, I think a few days ago, we were having a conversation and we're saying that when you go into the hospitals now, the AI works better than even human, the best of physicians. Before now, you talk about banking. A few years ago, I was, I was called to speak uh, at um, an edtech, a banking edtech summit. And I was telling the bank, I said, 
I think the best thing is for bank to start focus on investing on fintech. Banking has been disrupted. It's another sector that looks like you, it's almost impossible because that's where your money is. But it's been disrupted. You now have some young people today in Nigeria, in Kenya, in South Africa, who build just one or two apps. And they have much more number of customers than a very big bank with so many buildings. Education is also being disrupted. Mm. Whether we like it or not, it's already been disrupted. I think that there is a need to think about the future of jobs. I'm not saying that it's not important for us not to um, um, not to focus on specialization. Mm. Specialization is very okay, very key, but. Introducing technology will make the work a lot better. Yeah. The current system that we currently have, or that we run, I think it's more lecturer-centered. It will be good that we move beyond lecturer-centric classroom to a more student-centric classroom. And the only thing that can help and hit all of this is technology. I came in yesterday and I was having conversation with one of the uh, representatives from the un new uni. That's what we should be doing. And the only way to foster this collab collaboration and really make these things work, first, you have somebody who has a certification in one of the courses online because it's convenient and they teach you exactly what you need, the kind of skills you need for tomorrow's job. How do we incentivize them? in our current uh, uh, institution. It's a policy issue. It's a very, very big issue. I also think that education in Nigeria, maybe not only in Nigeria, should move beyond the brick and mortar. The experience of ed education. Well, just in just one small room here, how many people can actually learn in this room at the same time? There are platforms that can be set up, and you can have thousands and millions of people learning at the same time. Pair-to-pair -pair learning, collaborative learning. I think that is the kind of future that we should look at, and that is the kind of education that we should be talking about. Thank you. Can I, can I quickly? Uh, yes, uh, my dear colleague. Uh, I think COVID actually brought that to all of us. Before that, it was mostly physical, even when we have just a few persons who were using the other platforms. But COVID actually brought the reality. And as I speak to you now, most universities are running the ODL, the online you know, learning, distant learning programs. And a lot of them, we even have a university that has over 160,000 students enrolled on just that program. And almost all other universities are doing the same thing. So we've moved gradually. Again, like I said, are we taking giant steps? No. In my institution, and I think everyone seated here, we all have online learning units. And we're doing very you know, well. And the fact is because we want people to be at their own comfort, at their own time, at their own convenience, to join and learn. Because we know that in a country like ours, where the economic strength is still very weak, that some of such individuals can maybe during the day help their parents or run some shops or some kind of businesses. And then at night or during periods that are not high peak for their businesses, to then key in onto these online programs. So we're doing a lot of that. And I think uh, AUC, who is our regulatory body, is giving uh, you know, authority and licenses to almost all universities to do this so that we can have this. So even in lecturing, like you know, somebody said, over 40% of our population, if not more, are in this bracket. And no, a lot of universities cannot actually you know, admit all those students who really desire to join 
the tertiary you know, uh, education. So what we're doing is we are giving this platform to such persons. So if we cannot take you in physically, maybe join us from the other platform, the virtual pr platform. And so it's becoming more and more popular. And I know in the nearest future that that may even take over most of the you know, physical space. So yes, uh, I think you need to visit some of the universities more often so that you see what we are doing. I, I don't know if I can respond to that. Yes. Um, I'm, well, I'm, 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 I'm happy I'm a neighbor, and yes. I'll tell you why. COVID, COVID happened. Before you respond, sorry, sorry. Yes. just make an intervention. Okay. okay. Um, uh, I think three quick interventions I want to make. Number one, we must always remember that university education is for creation of the future. That's number one. Not necessarily creation of today. We need to be thinking about creating the future. And that is why, where we are, where we are. Number two, I think uh, one of the things Topia, that we need to, to really understand is that one challenge that we have had, uh, at least with my experience, that we are having as far as the, the kind of university education in Nigeria is concerned, is lack of the equipment, lack of laboratories, lack of facilities that will make students actually to go and do the practical aspect of it. And that is why it is important, very, very important, that, that there is that synergy between industry because mm -hmm. they should be able to support universities. They should be able to support universities understanding that, that the model of education, university education in Nigeria is not, is not a fantastic model. So therefore, I think it is important that that, that that synergy and that understanding also comes in. And that is why some of the universities are going out you know, to uh, industries, uh, looking for all various kind, types of supports. I can justify this because when you look at most Nigerians who have, who have done their first degree, where a lot of people will say it's a theoretical degree. But they go to Europe, they go to America, they excel. So that, tells, that says something about, about the quality you know, of education that, that is actually coming in. I think we need to be able to, to bridge the gap between that theory and practice. And one of the, the challenges that I have seen in Nigeria is that there are no opportunities, no facilities, you know, for, for the practical aspect of it. And that is, why, and that is where you and many other companies need to come in. Finally, the industry in Nigeria must tr begin to trust you know, uh, uh, um, uh, to have trust in a, in, in a Nigerian education. Because that's also a different, a, a very huge problem where we think that, well, um, we, the Nigerian universities are only doing theory and therefore we go out and look for, for people. We must begin to trust ourselves because when we do uh, trust ourselves, we are able to make uh, suggestions on how the systems can actually change you know, for the betterment of, of the country and the world. So those, those are just a few, a few remarks that I want to make before you, <laughs> you quickly respond. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I just wanted to mention that I have been doing this with education, with government for over 15 years. COVID happened and then uh, we were invited you need to provide a solution for students to be able to learn across the country. An organization was engaged to build a platform that over 2 million Nigerian students, primary and basic and secondary, can learn concurrently at the same time. That, that, that job was given to us. And during COVID, we developed that and created over 20,000 video content, bringing subject experts. So I've been involved. That's one. And I'll tell you why I sound this way. Because it's one thing to develop all of this. There's a need for, um, there is policy bit of it. Then there is, uh, um, you also need people's body language on adoption. I also tell you, even in the tertiary education space, a few years ago when um, the the current executive secretary of Third Fund assumed, assumed office. I was invited to come 
look at the strategy and the project of Petcom and the ICT, the ICT project. And one of the things that I saw and I liked and I said we can enhance is the terrace platform. Terrace is the future. But what is the adoption rate? And one thing that I saw with the terrace, one thing that I saw with the terrace was that something was missing. It's the identity. How do you make provision for people when there is no identity, when you don't know them? And we went forward, we built a system called the BIMS. The BIMS today, on the BIMS platform, you have over 2 million Nigerian students currently on the BIMS. What we're trying to achieve is to change the experience of education. In the event that COVID happens again, how do we learn? So I have been involved, but what is the adoption rate? I know it has a lot to do with policy. It has to do with will. And that's, what, that's why I'm also thinking that at this, at this conference, I can use this opportunity mm -hmm. to also have this conversation again. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. we, need, we, we need to work together. Mm -hmm. We must work together to have the Africa, the Nigeria that we deserve. <laughs> this conversation yeah. with the Nigerians is a perfect example of the future of higher ed mm -hmm. in the U.S. and global. And to go back to your, I guess, your first question about how do we take advantage of this moment, uh, Signithia, uh, uh, she's, uh, she's one of Dr. King's uh, mentors. She says, I like chaos. And someone said, why? She said, because creativity comes from creative chaos. Get into your piece of creativity. Yeah. What we're really talking about right now is the difference between schooling and learning. Yeah. Schooling, when we hear the term, we traditionally think of something like this, a building. We went through a traditional building. Learning takes place everywhere. It's ubiquitous, 24 hours a day. Absolutely. And so what we have right now is a moment to say we can have schooling, learning in schooling, and learning outside the concept of schooling. And this is where the entrepreneurs come in. Because you've got the traditional system as we know it, which I support, and you have the entrepreneurs who are learning what we do and we can learn from them. The bridge gap are all the entrepreneurs. They're the ones saying, here's how to use efficiency, here's how to reach more students, but you can't do it while listening to the deans, the provosts, the vice chancellors, and the others. So I take a NOAA approach. It's the partnerships getting on the boat to sail the seas of economic uncertainty. And when we land on dry ground, then we'll do better. But it's understanding the two.